day to remember a few things. We didn't just get here because of deficiencies in our character that uh, we didn't understand certain things. We got here because there was a willful, pointed drumbeat of decimation of our community. There are reports that say it will take 228 years to close the wealth gap. This is why. Why the net worth of a typical so-called white family is 10 times that of a black family. Why a black woman who holds more degrees, black women, more degrees than any other group in this country are saddled with 22% more debt and why the largest black owned bank in America has 10 times, 20 times fewer dollars than its Asian and Latina, Latinx counterparts. And today we're gonna to get some answers about why, why that is. I wanna introduce uh, my partner in power today. She is the author of a book called Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Let me welcome the one and only Marissa Baron. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's really great to be talking to you again, Karen. Listen, um, your book changed my life. You know, for, for so many times, uh, I might have been in the camp of like, let's just pull ourselves up our bootstraps. We've done it before. Look at Black Wall Street. Look at Rosewood. Look at Eatonville. Look at all of these communities we built. We did it before. We could do it again. And then I picked up your book uh, and I read it during the pandemic because <laughs> we had time. And there were a couple of chapters that stuck out. So let's start with this, the notion of the wealth gap and the new deal for, for white America. That's chapter four in your book. Uh, because I think that's where it really started. You know, a lot of people in this country will say, well, you know, my family came here with nothing with $2 in my pocket and my great grandfather and we made it. Why can't you tell us why? Um, this is one of the myths that I really, I mean, I think I, uh, I tried to debunk in the book, this idea that, um, you can leave the system of credit and banking and, uh, you know, federal policy intact, and you either alone or through your community can accumulate wealth, work hard, save your money, and, you know, close the, the wealth gap or, you know, gain riches yourselves. And, and of course, it does work um, in individual cases. But what we do is tend to take these individual cases, these exceptions, and make rules out of them. If you look at means and medians, the average American their assets are their homes, um, their education, you know, something like a 401k. And across every income level and edu education level, the black and white racial wealth gap is massive. So at the high end, it's about uh, 20 to 1. And at the lower end, it's about 10 to 1. So what you'll note is the higher income uh, uh, you go, the higher up you go in the income scale and the education scale, the larger that gap is. And that is because the way the history of racial segregation and racism embedded in market values, in housing values, in neighborhood values, in, in employment values, right, um, has has sed sedimented those um, those racial wealth gaps. And unless the sort of structures are changed, uh, individuals can sort of beat the odds, but the odds are the odds. And and I think th this is what I, I, I try to uh, break down in the book because it's not that what I'm saying is, you know, don't work hard and don't, you know, use community empowerment to, you know, as, as a means of protest, as a means of really uh, getting changes, but let's not lose sight of the fact that, that the racial wealth gap was created through federal policy, enforced by law, it was explicitly racist uh, credit policies that created where we are today. You don't even have to go back to uh, slavery. You don't have to go back to Jim Crow. You don't have to go back to you know uh, sharecropping. Although all of that is relevant, you can go back to the uh, the financial crisis of two thousand and eight, where black communities lost fifty three percent of their wealth. You, if you want to go a little bit further back, you can go back to the fact that. The civil rights laws, as monumental as they were, did not remedy the system of redlining that we had from 1934 until 1960. Or you can go back to 1934, where those red line maps specifically said, look, this neighborhood is black and we are not going to lend to this neighborhood. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't like a correlation. It, that race was the number one thing used. And that's the chapter I think you're referring to. And, and until you understand the history, I think, and I, and and really the the book, I, I don't, um, 
I'm, I'm, I have been hoping that it's white policymakers that understand this. And, and you know, I think it has been, uh, you know, uh, heated to some extent by them. But it's you can't just keep shifting the blame and the onus on the communities who did not create this problem uh, to fix it. It's confirmation. You know how you grow up, you know, something's not right. You know, you grow up in a black neighborhood and, you know, somehow our taxes are higher. We have less services. Is this on purpose? Somehow you, you understand that your house valuation is less than the house valuation of the town over that happens to be all white. Even though your neighborhood is equally as nice, if not better. Mm -hmm. Is this racist? And you know in your heart that it's racist, but in your book, you made you codified that. Yeah. You made it crystal clear. Mm -hmm. It took you 10 years, Professor mm -hmm. Mercer, to yeah. do this. And I and I asked you this question before because you're you're my Persian sister. I love you. Yeah. <laughs> but this, you know, you you have no no you, you have nothing to gain by doing mm -hmm. this. But it, you spent 10 years of your life proving mm -hmm. this. Why yeah. why was this important? Yeah. Uh, my my uh there's like an, an accidental story and then there's a self-serving story. I think the self-serving story is I started I have I have um, I was sort of radicalized on Wall Street during the financial crisis, uh, realizing that all banks are public. Like the fact that we were taught we were like making money for our bank customers as I was a Wall Street lawyer. And then all of a sudden the Fed swoop, swooped in with trillions of dollars and all these people lost their their homes. And I was living in Harlem at the time. And there's just massive foreclosures. And and I started writing as an academic about how. We, we had these myths about community banking and about, you know, people and, and free markets that were just not true. The, the truth was that there was always a federal superstructure and we just let these banks kind of create money and, and then we support them when they take too many risks. And so I started in, in my academic agenda just writing about that. And this project started as another example of me trying to prove that point. And I was going to use actually immigrant banks and black banks as part of that immigrant bank circuit just to say, look, how do how does it work that you have these other communities and how do they access that system without that federal credit? Um, but as I dug around and it took 10 years because I wasn't um, I needed to get all my receipts, as I say, in order before I could write a book like this. I wrote another book and several articles before I finished this one because, uh, you know, to be honest, there weren't that many people writing about the racial wealth gap. And I wasn't sure that what I was finding in the archives was completely like it, it seemed so shocking um, that that it hadn't been written. And, and I'm grateful that since I have written the book, a lot of other people have come up with supporting evidence a, as I was uh, finding through these red line maps. And so I uh, the the I guess, you know, that accidental story is that this is not the book I meant to write. It was a book about the immigrant banks. But as I started digging into the research and letting sort of my curiosity about what's going on here lead me, it really became about the racial wealth gap. And it became a much more I think I became more angry and cynical as I wrote, uh, partly too, I think, because I was writing at the sort of during the Obama administration as it was sort of ending and really kind of frustrated with the lack of progress, but also still a little bit hopeful that we were going to get there. And then as I was finishing up the book, it did take a long time, it looked clear that Trump was going to win. And I um, all of a sudden, um, as I was revising the book, it became clear to me, oh, this is this fits in exactly with history, as you know, Nixon after civil rights, Andrew Johnson after Recon or after the Civil War. You always have a radical white backlash, and so I became much more cynical wow. as the book headed um, into publication. And I think um, it, I've become even more cynical since. Although I am hopeful that at least we're talking about these issues in a way that we weren't uh, when I began the project. One of the um, passages that I read that really floored me, because again, you know, I was raised in a home where my father was fierce with saving, but we weren't investing. And there was a lot of distrust in my community about banks, mm -hmm. even now, you know, I'm not going to get involved in that stock market or this. And you talked about how soldiers after the Civil War were fiercely saving and all of their millions of dollars. You think about black people saving millions of dollars, black people who a year before were in bondage, mm -hmm. who were able to scrape together pennies and nickels to save millions of dollars and that money was squandered. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that drumbeat. And by the way, uh, 
you're watching the One United, One Transaction Conference, and you can actually ask questions. We're going to answer your questions live. I will ask them on your behalf to Mercer, Professor Mercer Barandaran. And um, so, so take us to yeah. that part of the soldiers, the, the, the Black soldiers from the Civil War, putting money in a bank and then having that bank do everything banks are not supposed to do because it was Black dollars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is exactly this is the first example of where you have a real movement for economic justice. Everyone, I mean, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, you know, um, uh, the 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 Republican allies, you know, Thaddeus Stevens and others were saying, look, you can't go from being capital. I mean, slaves were not just labor. This is a misunderstanding, I think, of the economics of slavery. They were capital upon which like any capital, wealth was made. So they were collateral for other loans. They financed uh, the purchase of other slaves and cotton and, and plantations. I'm sorry, I just want to pause you I'm, and I apologize for this. Yeah. As we as we proceed uh, to, to uh, shift the paradigm, we also need to change the language. These were human beings who were- Human beings, parties. yes. They were enslaved. Something enslaved. was done to them. They were just yes. not, you know, and I think you know, I had to learn that. So I want to make sure all everyone watching and, and listening, you know, these were human beings who had something done to them. They were put into bondage. They were enslaved. They were not slaves. So I just want to just thank you for that intervention. No, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly it. These were it was property in man. That was what was justified by the Constitution. And in fact, the currency of the South was enslaved people. It was that, and and because the the literal um, wealth of the South was the 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 capital built upon this horrific institution. And so you go from that into saying, okay, now we're gonna do capitalism and all of the freedmen were supposed to go from, you know, working these fields that they did not own to working them afterwards. And everyone was saying, well, you have to give people land because that is the currency of capitalism. You have to allow some sort of capital in order to um, um, start that process. And and uh, there was a moment where that was considered, you know, in the 40 acres. And it wasn't, uh, uh, it was a very serious um, uh, consideration. Because if you think about, you know, this, this, this Confederate South wasn't just it wasn't just a, this war. It was a treasonous. It was it was treason against the federal government, and the punishment for treason was hanging, and that was very much on the table. Like, should we hang the the southern, you know, uh, white plant, planter class that had um, uh, done treason, or do we just reallocate the land? It's so a re land reallocation was both punishment, and it was also a way of. Uh, at least allowing an equal uh, footing, and that did not happen. And instead, what the um, what happened, you know, through the the veto of Andrew Johnson, is the Freedmen's Bank, and the Freedmen's Bank is uh, was a savings account that was supposed to be, um, you know, protected by the federal government, and the savings account was sold as like, oh, this is a more responsible way to get land. Like you shouldn't like get it as a gift, you should earn it as though, you know, working the land for hundreds of years hadn't earned, you know, enough uh, uh, of the land. And and so that, even that money, that one, uh, I think it's like $1.5 billion in today's money, which was a lot at the time, um, uh, this, the white manager of the bank, Henry Cook, took the money and speculated it away on the, the like, it was like the subprime market of the day, which was railroad speculation, and poof, half of that money was gone. And so these are, like you said, I mean, imagine how hard it was to save money during a system of exploitation like sharecropping, where, you know, you were basically buying seed and you have barely had enough crop at the end of the season, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois called it a debt, a debt cycle that was just really, really impossible to get out of. And, and, and even the little money that was saved was was uh, taken away, just looted. You know, they looted this bank. No one went to prison. The money was gone. And um, I, I think that distrust, uh, you know, lingers for hundreds of years. But it's also the sense that, look, these were the good guys. The union, it was the union that had put together the Freedmen's Bank. And it was just a, it was a white philanthropy thing, right? So it was like, a, you know, what you can see today is like nice corporate donations that don't really do anything. Nobody uh, lost land. And more importantly, the bank didn't even lend money. It just was supposed to save the money and it didn't even do that. So, so I actually think that there are several examples in US history. The second one also I think is after civil rights in uh, President Nixon's black capitalism program that you know the two options during the civil rights movement were you know housing grants 
through you know a reversal of redlining or reparations, which was you know a core um, a, a proposal that was actually taken seriously by Congress uh, before the election, and both of those were scuttled as Nixon said, "Yep, yeah, we're going to do black capitals." I and mean, what black capitals meant was just a decoy. It was the Freedmen's Bank all over again. It was we're going to put deposits into these banks, and we're going to say you keep that segregated economy, and we're just going to do nice stories of of businesses. And I think that is a really dangerous subversion of um, actual movements for justice that I think we should keep our eyes open for in this third pivotal um, era right now. So in addition to stealing people's money, and again, that floored me because I don't, I can't even imagine sharecropping. I can't even imagine having just come off of a plantation mm -hmm. and saving every dime because I see a future mm -hmm. to have it taken away. Mm -hmm. And then what do you do? And in the midst of that, we had the red summer of 19, mm -hmm. uh, 18, uh, 1919, mm -hmm. and then 1921, mm -hmm. Tulsa. Tulsa. Mm -hmm. But there's and Wilmington, Delaware, and yeah. Atlanta, Georgia, I mean, and yes. you know, Fulton County. There's Go on. The list. And this, and this yeah. one thing. So even, yeah. mm -hmm. even when we don't have the bank, we rely on self build, mm -hmm. and then somebody comes through an act of racism, terrorism, domestic terrorism, and takes it away. Mm -hmm. And then we have to build again. Mm -hmm. So we keep rebuilding. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about solutions at the end of this, but I want this drum beat to really sit in mm -hmm. people's spirits, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing deficient about Black people. We've always mm -hmm. saved. We've always invested. We've always done for self. We've always pulled ourselves up even when we didn't have boots or bootstraps. Mm -hmm. the, the, the New Deal, that great New Deal that created this middle class. Mm -hmm. is, uh, Can I say right. something about violence? Just Absolutely. You know, I think, yeah, the violence is really important to understand, um, you know, as I was reading a lot of the accounts by these black bankers and black real estate brokers at the time, it, you know, uh, it, it's it's easy to say like, you know, the, the violence happens in Tulsa, but what does that have to do with Durham? Well, the way that terrorism works, domestic terrorism works is it's that fear. It's you lynch someone in a public square and that that is meant to send a message of fear to every other business person in the area. So um, black patent holders, black bankers, black property owners, anyone who even deemed to build a nice house. That's why Tulsa was uh, ransacked and looted and bombed to bits was because the black community had gained success. So like you said, there has always been entrepreneurship. There has always been saving. There has always been creative entrepreneurs in these communities. But as soon as the resentment grew, um, there would be these hostile acts of terrorism. And this is where the law never stepped in to protect black homeowners and black property owners. And this happened in the North. I mean, Jesse Binga is a black banker in my book that I uh, focus on, very successful real estate broker, successful black banker. His house was bombed 10 times and he kept moving back. Uh, Dr. Ashen Sweet, you know, in, in Chicago, um, you know, was armed to protect his home. And, you know, rioters came with, with uh, you know, uh, co Molotov cocktails and threw them into his house. And, and that was a family, you know, that lived in, in these houses. And so you, if you were going to buy a home to invest, you didn't just have to worry about getting enough you know, money for the mortgage. You also had to worry about the white mob that was going to come. So, the, the, you know, we talk about r racial riots now. The only racial riots in America, and you know, uh, that weren't called racial riots were white riots on black properties. And, and then, of course, the lynch mobs um, that also kind of put that terrorism in. And so a lot of black business leaders and black leaders in general um, operated under a real threat of bodily harm. And I don't think we can underestimate what that does to a business, to its business's customers, if you feel like if you can't get people to walk in your door and have physical safety, if you can't put your deposits in a white owned bank, Maggie Walker talks about this. She's the first woman of any race to own a bank. She's the first black banker um, in, in the state of Virginia. And she um, uh, would put her deposits in a white bank because you have to have some transactions. And sometimes that white banker wouldn't let her withdraw when she needed to. So there was these you know, acts of coercion and um, violence where the law didn't protect and it really inhibited that sort of um, trust in the businesses. And you even think about um, Ida B. Wells, who was inspired to, and I say inspired in a way that motivated to go out and talk about lynchings after her friends who had a grocery store that white people would come to because it was so good. The white grocer being angry came in 
tried to kill him. Mm-hmm. He shot one of them yep. and then they lynched. Mm-hmm. And there was no recourse. No one went to jail. And that seems to be the story on the heels as we fast forward to last summer and the summer of Freddie Gray and the summer of Mike Brown. All they were concerned about is black people burning down a CVS or black people looting their own communities. They care about property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, They want to come in and and law and order that. mm -hmm. But all of these communities that were decimated, they never did. So they don't care about property. They only Mm -hmm. care about white property. That's right. And if you look at the the Ferguson report in Ferguson, Missouri, after the the Michael Brown shooting, you look at the way that that police department was funded by civil forfeitures, illegal, I mean, uh, outside of the the law, you know, civil forfeitures, the the tickets and the and the the way that they that that whole like exploitative structure, you know, and so you say, look, you've been looting these communities for years and we don't call it looting, we just call it, you know, civil fines. Um, but it is, it has the same effect. And I think you look at the way that, you know, uh, the New Deal p- property allocations work. I mean, that was really a, there was benefits to, you know, they created a all white suburb um, at the expense of that black um, inner inner city red line zone. And, and there was profits gained off of the backs of exploitation. Those patents that black patent owners did not get went to the white person who stole the patent. The 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 property that you know was uh, that where the owner was lynched was handed over to uh, to white men and and that is property that has remained and you know you look at even Native American property uh, dispossession that you know the, the the white men would just take the property from these um, tribes and that money stays in that community it is not you know just that person's theft it it goes in, it's like a legacy built on that initial theft and and so that that's where I think the 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 imperative of justice and and reparations and 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 redress comes from. I'm talking with, of course, Mirsa Baradoran. She is the author of Color of Money. And you all, this should be a must read book in any any home, anybody that's here right now, please go out and get this book because it is absolutely amazing. I want to get back to the New Deal for a second because there, again, this notion that America was made great upon this wonderful FDR program that created this wonderful middle class. That butt clause, just like the the end of slavery, butt clause, but for incarceration. Oh, now we get to have slavery again. Mm -hmm. This new deal excluded folk that Mm -hmm. worked in the fields and people that did domestic work, which were the Mm -hmm. two jobs Mm -hmm. that black people were relegated to Mm -hmm. for 30 years Mm -hmm. until the 1970s. Black people could not participate in this wonderful program that built the middle class in this country. And we talk about a wealth gap that will take 228 years to close. Mm-hmm. How big a deal was that new deal in, in hurting our, our progress? Uh, it was a huge new deal because it wasn't just the, uh, you know, leaving out domestic workers and farm workers, which was purposeful. It was, I mean, if you think about who passed the new deal, yes, it was FDR, but it was a Southern Democrat Senate that didn't allow a single anti-lynching bill to get passed until Cory Booker just recently uh, passed one. So so the Southern Bloc was the the stronghold against any civil rights. And those are the guys who passed the New Deal. And so they excluded certain workers. They um, allowed white unions to exclude black workers. And they also did not allow this massive trillion dollar mortgage um, guarantees to go to black communities. And so that really cements the racial wealth gap into this uh, century. And so if you, it's not just about, look, it's not, you know, when we talk about racial wealth gap, it's not about the assets you ha- someone has on their balance sheet. It's also about what neighborhood they um, they were able to, you know, kind of gain equity in their grandparents or their parents were their parks, were their um, schools that are funded by property taxes. And then the environmental hazards. Okay, so where do you put the bus depot and the, you know, the the, the lead paint that you don't remedy, the Flint water crisis? That is not accidental either, because those were in the communities that didn't have that sort of, you know, uh, white suburban wealth that was financed by by the New Deal uh, government programs. And so you have an environmental um 
hazards being primarily suffered by, you know, the, the black community that was left. You have the then highways, you know, in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s run through the center of those neighborhoods that had been built, even despite, right? So uh, all of the, the, the exclusion, people had still had built neighborhoods. And then you get that sort of, you know, urban uh, renewal highways um, that decimated the neighborhoods again. And, and just the cycle of, you know, businesses leaving the white home with the white homeowners and um, uh, really exploitative lenders coming back in. So payday lending, for example, isn't a phenomenon until, you know, the, the 1980s when banks have just completely left the inner cities and the check cashers and the payday lenders come in. So if you look at the maps of payday lenders, it's where the installment lenders were. This is where the red line communities had been. Those maps have hardly changed. If you look at where George Floyd was murdered, you know, I actually did this analysis as you look at where George Floyd was murdered. And that neighborhood was a red line neighborhood. It is the highest, it's a banking desert. It's a food desert. It has the most payday lenders in the area. It is an area that is over-policed and under-resourced. It is an area where the schools are you know, not given the funds. And so you look at this horrific video and that's the tip of the iceberg. That, that, is, the, that is the thing that rightfully gets the world out on the streets saying enough. But if you look at the whole iceberg, this is a system of exploitation. And the people not being murdered have been over-policed and ignored and, and subjected to all sorts of uh, you know, environmental hazards and police violence and the trauma of all of that that's compounded over time, uh, that I think it um, it's, it's really important to focus on these things. But I think um, police brutality is, is just one part of, of a way a bigger historic problem. We're here Juneteenth uh, at this amazing conference with Marissa, Marissa Barra Duran, uh, the author of Color of Money. And again, I, I want to reiterate that this is about remembering just as much as it's a celebration of the end of slavery. It's to remember that we've always been. And this book, again, lays it out factually you know, historically gives us the nuggets that we need to verify that, yes, we are in this condition for a reason that is usually government sanctioned, definitely uh, government ignored, if not sanctioned, then they've ignored some things. But also there's a period of hope in the book that I feel like we can hook into to pull us forward to today as we celebrate Juneteenth. There's a, um, and it's ironic, I think, 1863 to 1865, right? You fast forward 100 years, you talk about Martin Luther King, who many of us know he was killed, not just because he was against Vietnam, but because he was talking about poor people and having a movement in this country to lift folk up out of poverty. Ooh, wait a minute. <laughs> that two-year period where JFK was still alive, talk about that and what was happening and how we can use that as maybe a blueprint for what can happen now. Yes, that's so important. And I think this is... Um... You know, when uh, Reagan made Martin Luther King a national holiday, um, I think, uh, and uses the one sentence totally out of context from his speech to say, look, it's done. Civil rights is done. That was a speech that, that Reagan used to make Martin Luther King a national holiday. He says, look, we, we, we fixed it. We fixed civil rights. And, and Martin Luther King, you know, if you look at the entirety of the speech, first of all, and, and the entirety of his legacy, uh, you know, he talks about my dreams turned into a nightmare a year later. He uh, was was I mean, it was barely just starting because if you think about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, that gave no new rights to the black community that they had not earned themselves um, in the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. The problem was that those rights were not honored. And so, so what the, the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act do is just say, we're serious this time. And, and they, it, I mean, it wasn't that serious, but, but still the federal government was going to actually enforce them this time, unlike the last time. And, and so every principle of the civil rights movement, including Lyndon Johnson, who was not, you know, a hero who did not invite Martin Luther King into the White House to sign the Civil Rights Act, he, he even realized that they had many, many steps to go in order to achieve justice. He says, you, Johnson says, you can't take a man who's been behind by 300 years and say, okay, go, you know, you're on equal footing. Um, and, and, but really, I mean, the entire world shifted between 1965 and 1968. So um, Roger, uh, I think 
Roger Wilkins of NAACP says, Roy, Roy, Wilkins. Roy Wilkins, yeah, I knew it was wrong. <laughs> um, Roy Wilkins of the NAACP says in 1966, he says, you could not pass the Emancipation Proclamation in the environment in that Congress in 1966. Um, so, um, rabidly angry was that backlash. Um, and, and so, you know, you look at who was murdered and Medgar Evans, uh, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Rob, Bobby Kennedy, you know, and, and, and the Chicago, you know, um, uh, uh, movements, you know, against the democratic, you know, the Hubert Humphrey and all of the, you know, the black Panthers murdered by the FBI in their homes, you know, and, and, and I think, Moving into Nixon, it's like everything just shifted backwards. And all of a sudden you have white people saying, well, where are my rights? Why, you know, now this is reverse discrimination and busing is taking away my constitutional rights. And and it, it, it's really um, uh, eye opening to look at the original sort of writings of that era and realize how um, whitewash that history became over time and how we we tell the story of civil rights i mean not all of us but america writ large you know if you look at the, the official documents tell the story of civil rights as though it fixed a thing and it was just starting and so i think exactly as you said is is understanding that helps us perhaps be a little bit skeptical, not completely skeptical. I mean, understand that change is, is possible and you can get majorities on board to demand justice, but you always have to be watching out for that backlash that will turn your movement against you. And, and so I think um, we're at a different place now than we were five years ago. Um, I, you know, I, but mm -hmm. if you learn the lessons of history, it is to just be a little bit wary of, of just celebrating before we're done. And I think to be done, and this, you know, on like you said, the 228 years of closing the racial wealth gap, if we don't do anything, it's, we, we you know, we won't close it in 200 years. Um, but we could actually fix it in much less time than 220 years. But if we do nothing, time isn't going to fix it by itself. Which is why one transaction, one united call for everyone to hashtag one transaction is super important because it requires each of us to do something. And it's not enough for each of us to do something as today is Juneteenth. I need us to not celebrate because this is not the end of anything. This is the beginning or should be the propelling of something uh, so that we don't go backwards and we don't have that wealth gap end up being 250 years, mm -hmm. 300 years. We can definitely shorten it. I think we can do it in five years if we all mm -hmm. make a commitment. Uh, and talk about that for a little bit, because it's interesting mm -hmm. how you could predict Trump was going to win based on what had happened in the past. I was oh, shocked. No, I, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to give myself credit. I was no, shocked. I mean, I, I actually predicted yeah. he could win too, because you, mm -hmm. you had mm -hmm. a black president for eight years yeah. and everyone said post-racial. And I was like, have you mm -hmm. been in America? Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward people, critical race theory. We don't yeah. want we don't, we don't want to feel bad about being white. So let's ban any talk about actual history. You just told us in the 60s, same thing happened. Mm -hmm. Heading into Nixon, same thing happened. So now we have Joe Biden as president. That's great. We have a Juneteenth holiday. That's great. But we got a whole lot of angry so-called white people because there's no such thing as whiteness. I'm going to say that on this thing right here. I'm going to say it. It's a made up construct to continue to do the things you've been writing about in your book and get away with it. Mm -hmm. So now... Mm -hmm. Mercer, what do we do moving yeah. forward? Okay, we have fortunately a good, we have the Congress, we mm -hmm. have the Senate, we have the House, we have the President, mm -hmm. right? We mm -hmm. have people who are motivated, activated in them streets out there doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. We have more millionaires in the Black community, more billionaires than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. We have millions and billion, bil millionaires and billionaires who are forgiving debt and who actually care about Black people. They're not just like, ah, Republicans buy sneakers too. They're actually mm -hmm. out there doing some things. Mm -hmm. Do you think we have a ripe ground to, to close that wealth gap really quickly? And if so, what do we need to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a ripe ground. I think it's it takes policy. I think it takes relentless political pressure. The Black Lives Matter movement, I think, in my lifetime was one of the most inspiring um, movements I have seen um, that really felt like it's making change. And that's why people are scared. I mean, this critical race theory stuff, this anti-1619, I mean, this is a good sign, <laughs> I think. That, and, you know, and at least, you know, you even see that the, 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 like, 
the white white supremacists at least acknowledging well republicans were the ones that ended slavery you know you actually have you know this this weird um backlash that actually even acknowledges that um some of this stuff was was hor horrific so so i think um i, I think that uh keeping that forward motion on that black lives matter movement and and the and the ways that that movement you know sort of brought in a bunch of people together i think um building cross you know racial coalitions like martin luther king tried to do for black justice is really important and so this is where i kind of talk to my fellow you know immigrant brown people is um look we were immigrants cc'd in as Martin Luther King fought for civil rights. They said, oh, and, you know, inclusive. No, none of us uh, immigrants uh, from, you know, whatever shithole countries would be here if Martin Luther King hadn't included us in that drive for civil rights. Um, Nicole Hannah-Jones was right in, in this her essay that Black Black communities have pushed for everyone else's civil rights. And, and I think this is what I loved about the Black Lives Matter movement is um, seeing uh, not just that it, it was a, it was a black led movement, but that there were other people um, also joining. And I think that is really important just politically in a majoritarian democracy for everyone to say, I do not want to live in a country where uh, Black men are killed like that in front of my eyes. I do not want to live in a country that has a racial wealth gap where some schools are under-resourced and other schools aren't. I don't want to live in a country where my kid gets a better resource school than some other kid. Um, those That money should be equal. And I think um, that, that movement is essential. I think we can absolutely change it. I think it takes some federal acknowledgement of what's gone wrong. Um, this week, uh, the White House um, uh, Economic Council, um, led by Cecilia Rouse, who's the first Black, I think, head of the Economic Council, um, wrote about exclusionary zoning um, as part of the racial wealth gap. I think there is a lot of room for optimism optimism here in the Biden administration. They're at least acknowledging. I mean, Biden called Tulsa a massacre. Um, he, you know, has has used the words a racial wealth gap and and has committed his administration to, you know, cross agencies fix it. Now, I, I think it's right to be skeptical. I think that is um, uh, the history is not, you know, uh, on in favor of, of of real movement happening. But I think um, the the voters really sent that message. If you look at what delivered, you know, the White House to Joe Biden, I think he he has to understand that the mandate came from, you know, Philadelphia, Atlanta, um, Detroit. Those were the states that delivered him um, the vote, as has always been um, uh, the the sort of you know swing vote in the Democratic Party. And so I think. You know, just from a political standpoint, I think we, we need to to make those moves. And I think the way to do it is just a cross government, cross society movement and, and an unrelenting one, not, not taking um, just, you know, uh, window dressing to really get at structural reform as as previous civil rights leaders had demanded as well. And as you mentioned, um, Johnson didn't even welcome Martin Luther King in. He was forced. Yes. to do something. And, you know, a lot of us believe, well, we elected them. They're our friends now. They're going to do everything. Well, what about this? And what about that? People have to be made to do something. Even Obama said, hey, I'm I'm president of the United States. If you want me to do something, you have to make me. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have missed that point. You know, the election is just step maybe seven on a mm -hmm. whole 10 step plan. We elected you. Now we got to hold you accountable. We got to be <laughs> fierce and vigilant and make sure that you do all of the things or else Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, I appreciate that. Color of Money is the name of the book. I, as I mentioned, we're going to welcome in some questions from the folk who have signed up. And thank you guys for joining us on this Juneteenth. This is the perfect way to spend this holiday in building and growing, building yourself in your community. This is the perfect way to spend Juneteenth, Juneteenth and honor those people in Galveston who worked for two extra years toiling in a field after they were already free. All right, let's go to, uh, we're not gonna give out names. There's a question about mitigating the consequences of this racist system. How can we save if we're not earning enough to save? And I'm going back to the people who were sharecropping, who clearly were not earning enough to save. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Mercy? Yeah, you know, um, I don't, I, I think uh, saving is always a good idea, but 
no one's ever become rich by saving their money in America. <laughs> I mean, look, uh, the way that the middle class has built wealth is through credit, government credit. And this is where one bank uh, or one United and uh, what, what, you, what you're doing. I mean, we we save banks have power and, and give them power to lend on mortgages in homes. And those mortgages have to increase in value. So I think that that's sort of how uh, wealth is created. I think this this idea that, um, you know, people just need to save more money, whatever, you know, look, uh, uh, the data is pretty clear on this. The lower, uh, you know, people make rational decisions that the less income you have, um, the better you are at managing your income. All of us make mistakes, make financial mistakes, but for some people, that fi those financial mistakes can lead to disaster. And so that th those are problems that are structural. If we're not making enough, a lot of Americans aren't making enough to save money. It's not that they're not saving money, it's that there isn't anything left at the end of the month to save because they have to meet these needs. And so I think um, it is, it is the, this idea that oh just save more money is is really like blaming the victim here where you're not that there aren't enough wages and I, I think this is really changing if you listen closely to the debates right now about unemployment where these businesses are complaining that if we give unemployment checks which maintain people at a poverty level if we give unemployment checks then people won't work the tacit acknowledgement here is that the threat of poverty and starvation is what we need to get people to work. Now, that that is something that has been a recognized policy in American history, um, especially when it comes to black and brown communities. You look at that unemployment rate, the, comfort, the, the way that we are comfortable with a 10, 11 percent black unemployment rate, where if that was applied across the board, that would be a depression. OK, so so those those kinds of things and just say, oh, if we give people the bare minimum of survival, they won't work. Well, think about how much in wages we need to pay to give people dignity and a living wage and, and the the amount, the ability to have uh, 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 savings and, uh, you know, a home and and all the stuff that we tell people is a good thing to have. Um, we need to cancel student debt. We need to um, give housing grants. We need to, you know, look at, there's like a whole generational and then a whole racial thing happening with student debt for a young uh, black students right now who carry more of that debt than anyone else. And they're doing, these are students who are doing what we told them to do. They're going to the best colleges or going to historically black universities. And, and, and then we're leaving them with debt. And, and so I think these are really um, important um, interventions that need to be done. And then the savings will come. It's not, uh, I, I just fundamentally think it is wrong um, to blame the racial wealth gap on anyone's personal decisions. Uh, except if we're talking about, you know, policymakers, Nixon's decisions, right? And, and we should have a basic income. Uh, yes. Also, I just wanted to throw that in there. Another question, uh, the person says, I don't know if it's a byproduct of, a brain, of brainwashing we've been subjected to, uh, but how do we dispel this mistrust that we have of one another in the black community with regard to banking with a quote, black bank? Mm -hmm. I have thoughts. <laughs> you go first. It, it, if, yeah, you know, I mean, I think this is something that has been pervasive in in history, and I think uh, I go through kind of some of the dialogues in this book. I mean, W. E. B. Du Bois talked about this. Carter G. Woodson uh, talked about this. Martin Luther King talked about this, um, and it is it is uh, uh, both. Um, relevant because you know you have the Freedmen's Bank and so there's this distrust of banking in general that has been passed down a very rational distrust I would say because a lot of people did have their money stolen by by white banks um and then the distrust of of black banks I think part of it is that is just distrust of banking in general and and part of it is um you know I, I, maybe an, you know, a, a thing about um feeling like that, that sort of internalized racism of we we think that everything in that white community is better. I think a lot of um, uh, communities experience this and and something that we all need to work on. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, even immigrant communities are, you know, that stuff is piped out. I'm reading a book called Propaganda, Ed mm -hmm. Bernays, and he talks about the power of the media, the power of, a media, mm -hmm. of movies and, and the written word as far as delivering messages. Hitler was great at using that. He had a filmmaker, you know, during his tenure because mm -hmm. messaging is important. I don't know what it would look like for 400 years to be told that mm -hmm. you're less than, you're, you're inferior, your brain mm -hmm. is smaller, you, mm -hmm. you're, you're cannibals, you, you come mm -hmm. from nothing, and then be able to 
generation after generation after generation after generation because there's a lot of generations during that 400 year period yep. yep so that's number one the fact that there's a black bank right now that has nearly a billion dollars in assets mm -hmm. speaks volumes about how mm -hmm. you know how well we've overcome a lot of the brainwashing but it's still there mm -hmm. and we have to work every day to do that coupled with understanding if that largest black owned bank only has a billion or mm -hmm. less than a billion. The largest mm -hmm. Hispanic owned bank has 20 billion. The largest mm -hmm. Asian owned bank has 30 billion. And let's mm -hmm. not even talk about the largest white owned bank, right? Fucking trillions, yeah. yeah. Several yes, trillions. you're operating yeah. as so much less to deliver equal, how? So mm -hmm. we have to work twice as hard to make sure that the largest black owned bank has enough assets to be able to operate at the level. We can't bitch and complain about why, oh, they don't have this, they don't have that, they don't have this, when they are operating at 20 to 30, mm -hmm. 100 times less than mm -hmm. the bank that, you know, so it's, it's this and that. I mean, you know, look, I mean, Jeff Bezos owns $130 billion in personal assets and didn't pay a lick of federal taxation, right? So I, I actually think it's time to put pressure on the, the these white serving institutions and, and really just, I mean, to, to, to uh, demand uh, taxes and, 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 and wealth from those. I mean, JP Morgan, $1 billion they paid in fines for racial discrimination. Uh, so, so those that Wells is Fargo money. Too. Wells Fargo, don't please. Wells don't Fargo. Me. I mean, the money that was extracted out of the black community—that fifty-three percent, those bank, the, the banks that got saved got a hundred cents on the dollar. Black communities lost fifty-three percent of their wealth. None of it has come back into those communities. And so, it is to say, well, well, it's their fault. You should save more money. It's just incredibly insulting. Um, and it's insulting to all of us who saw it happen. It's like you you want us to believe something that we did not see with our own eyes, which is that AIG was, you know, failed and was nationalized by the federal government. OK, and now we're saying, oh, capitalism, like that, 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 that's not capitalism. We nationalized the bank and then gave their shareholders 100 cents on the dollar. And we and, and one United tried to get a little bit of TARP funds and there was this massive fiasco. And, and so I think this is this double standard. I mean, I, I follow this in the book. You can look at the, the black banks got none of those, those TARP funds, except Carver Bank, which was then um, bought by Goldman Sachs. Uh, so, and Goldman Sachs got a hundred cents on the dollar. So, so, so really, I mean, um, there's a lot, there's a lot that we can be demand. We need to be demanding of those white institutions uh, because they owe, they owe the, the black they, community. They owe, they owe, and it's not reparations. It's what's owed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it is reparations. It's repairing. Last question. Mm -hmm. Last question. For people who have class and wealth privilege, who are serious about redistribution of wealth, do you have advice on how to do this? Well, I think you're just you're telling us you just told us yeah. how to be effective, yeah. how how to be. Yeah, we have to put pressure and shout out to Mackenzie Scott. Can we do that today? Because she is the, the wealth of the wicked stored up for the righteous. She is. Yes. You get yes. you get a million. You get five million. You get them. Yes. She is giving away all of the half of the Bezos money that she has. I'm praying uh, that Melinda Gates does the same with, yes. with Bill's money and just gets that out there. But, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think for, for those people in, in positions of privilege, I think we we can, one, use our political pressure in, in places that we can, you know, we can be heard and and two, just absolutely support. I mean, do the things that that, uh, you know, um, we, we would want everyone to do to to um, to make justice happen. And I think um, speaking out and and uh, allowing for, uh, you know, not hoarding those privileges, which is something that I think a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the 20%, because we're talking about the 1%, but there's a, like a 20%, 30% of the top. And there's this privilege hoarding that happens. Even those, you know, middle-class families who end up, you know, moving their kids or their families into these privilege hoarding situations and to really acknowledge our, you know, how we're all implicated in this. And, and we're all implicated and that's okay to say, look, you know, the institution that I work at, you know, is a public university, but it's got some, you know, skeletons in that closet. Every, every place that we all work at has got, has got some stuff to deal with and, and no one's pure, but to just recognize and acknowledge and not be defensive and to put it out there and to really just claim justice. And, you know, we can call it reparations, we can call it damages, we can call it truth and reconciliation, but it's healing for all of us.
I love I love all of that. Um, and for those who have the the um, money to do so, be intentional about how you spend it. And collectively, we have seen collectively when when black folk in particular who spend more money for less services, we spend more money in every sector and, and we consume more media. When we decide we're not going to spend money, corporations capitulate really quickly really quickly, Coca-Cola and all these others, I don't want to name, I shouldn't do that. But every company that has had black people say, we're not spending with you, have come to the table to do something different. So that means that we have power. When we use it, things will change. So I think we also need to be mindful of how we spend our money. Everybody watching right now, open an account at One United. Mm -hmm. Be intentional about that, you know, not just because you're on this, but if you are fed at all today, you 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 have to as a responsibility to make sure that this bank has as much power and resources to do the things that you want it to do. And then you can hold them accountable. But we can't just sit on the sidelines complaining about why we don't have, or why we have less or why this gap and I don't have enough money if we're not willing to do the things that we can do to close it and to make a difference. So that's my little two cents. Mm -hmm. All right. So you are doing a lot. Um, Marissa, how can people follow you besides buying your great book, The Color of Money? How do they connect with the work that you're doing and what else are you working on? Um, you can, you know, I'm on Twitter, Marissa Baradaran. Um, the book is available everywhere, probably. Um, uh, um, I, I, I'm working on a, a, a broader book to kind of um, look at how the political system that we have um, started in, in that post. I mean, I learned a lot in those Nixon archives. And I think, um, that, you know, I'm trying to uh, make a, a case about how that racist backlash harmed the entirety of America. American society and how that the the way that we use race as a uh, a weapon against uh, certain groups ended up flinging like that dirt back on, onto the faces of the people who could have used um, some some justice, uh, which was what Martin Luther King was trying to achieve. And I follow that into, you know, private equity and, and corporations and, and the way that we've allowed sort of this free market capitalism myth to run over our, our community, take the jobs and and all of the stuff that is, is less about racism now. Now it's just a thing that we've let loose and can't put back in the bottle. As you as you're talking, and I know we have to wrap, um, I'm I'm thinking, you know, there there's a bunch of quotes about how racism destroys all of us. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we drive that message home? You know, this is not just about black wealth, this is not about closing the wealth gap so that black people can get on top of some. This is about the future of America. Can you just drive that home? You know, I don't know what, what people's religious upbringing is, but you know, I I grew up in the Christian church and, you know, both Christian and Muslim. And there's every religion, I think, and, and every spiritual um, legacy, no matter what it is, has some sense of um, uh, atoning for wrongs and, and, and lies. And, and I think it, it is, um, it, the, it corrupts you and the person that you've hurt. You know, this, 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 I think racism, like you said, the myths about um, you know, racial inferiority and superiority of, of white uh, people and this fiction of whiteness anyway. Um, I think this is this rotting, festering thing in the middle of our society. And, and the way that, you know, these religious traditions look at it is to say, you have to, you have to acknowledge it and you have to atone for it. What use the word, you know, you have to um, uh, sort of give it out into the universe and put it out there so that it can uh, resolve itself. And I think this will really heal all of us. I think we are sick from this, both, both the anti-CRT. I mean, look at the, the hysteria right now about teaching American history and tell me that is not a mental illness. I mean, the fact that these white parents are terrified that their kids are going to learn about enslavement is 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 a really sad and sorry state for people to be in. What are you hiding your kids from? What are you shielding? And isn't it better if we just come out and acknowledge it and free free our uh, all of us fr from from this toxic sort of lie that we're trying to you know uphold? So let Juneteenth also be freedom from this toxicity. Yes. Thank you so much, Marissa Baradaran. Color of Money is the book. Up Thank next, you, our 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 grand leaders. Uh, Kevin Coey, Terry Williams, and of course, you're going to listen to some music as they kick it to the breakout sessions. I'm Karen Hunter. I'll see you later on today. Mm -hmm.